Alright, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman. So this is the third book in his, his Dark Materials trilogy, which is pretty much my favourite trilogy ever written. I must admit, my favourite book is Northern Lights, which is the first book, and I do feel the trilogy does lose a bit of steam as we go through it. But uh, we'll get to that later on. Now I read this as part of uh, Rereadathon. This is organised by Alex Black. It was created by Catalyst Reads, who's no longer part of BookTube, unfortunately. And uh, I can't even remember what the prompt was. Basically, I fell behind with my prompt, and so um, I tried to catch up by listening to like four or five audiobooks in a single month. So I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and talk about some of the different things that I uh, that I wanted to to point out from this. The third book in the His Dark Materials trilogy. Will is the bearer of the knife. Now, accompanied by angels, his task is to deliver that powerful, dangerous weapon to Lord Asriel by the command of his dying father. But how can he go looking for Lord Asriel when Lyra is gone? Only with her help can he fathom the myriad plots and intrigues that beset him. The two great powers of the many worlds are lining up for war, and Will must find Lyra, for together they are on their way to battle, an inevitable journey that will even take them to the world of the dead. Not a big fan of the World of the Dead stuff, to be honest, but we'll get to that later, I suppose. So, I, the first note that I have is that the intro quotes are a bit wanky. Um, it possibly didn't help that... Well, I listened to this via the audiobook, and so it's narrated by Philip Pullman himself as well. And he has quite a posh voice. But yeah, these are quotes from... Uh, so we've got Robert Grant from Hymns Ancient and Modern. Um, Rainer Maria Rilke from the Third Duino Elegy. Uh... John Ashbury so like the quotes for example oh stars isn't it from you that the lover's desire for the face of his beloved arises doesn't this secret insight into her pure features come from the pure constellations which as I say just a little bit wanky <laughs> uh, we have the angels in this as well what they call Bal Baltimore and Baruch and um, yeah they have this sort of non-gay brotherly love that could also be a bit gay I don't think it's really clarified and I don't think it really matters but yeah these are the two angels one of them was was a man before he was an angel and the other one I think was always an angel and um, we have this really sad bit where I've just written down R.I.P. Lee Scoresby and that's because he was one of my favourite characters and uh, he meets his end at the end of The Subtle Knife the last book and in this book um, basically Yorick Burnison the armoured bear who is a friend of Lee's he goes to sort of see what's happened and he reaches Lee's body and it's been protected by the witch. They put a token of a flower on his body and it stopped it from rotting and stuff. And then so Yorick kind of thanks him for this final gift and then basically eats his friend's body because he's starving because he's literally travelled between worlds. Which is very sad but also pretty badass, you know. And we have this... It was around there, I think, actually, the, ch the chapter called Scavengers and it kind of reflects... The scavengers, which are the uh, the foxes, uh, I believe they're like cliff foxes or whatever, uh, arctic foxes, and they've picked up bits of the human language, but only when it's spoken in the present tense, which I quite enjoyed. And um, yeah, they're scavengers, and so are the cliff ghasts, who end up like tearing the foxes apart. We also have a few different references to the word scree, which is a great word, not used very often, but I am a big fan of that word. My uncle actually, uh, there's a sort of family story, I guess. My uncle got stuck on an adventure game once where he had to find a scree slope. There's definitely a slower start to this book than the first two books, I think. Uh, the first book kind of has a slower start, but you're kept interested by the world building. And then in the second book, we pretty much start right away with Will accidentally becoming a murderer. And then in this book, it's just a slow start. Our, our entire sort of first hundred pages are pretty much... All about this build-up um, towards a rescue attempt. We do have um, the idea of preemptive absolution, which I quite like. So the priests are able to do penance for a sin they've not yet committed. So the magisterium, which is like the church in, in Lyra's world. And yes, yeah, so they um, basically pre-absolve this priest guy so that he can go and kill Lyra. Who, bear in mind, she's like 13, 14. Pretty messed up. But he's fine because he thinks he's on a mission from God. There's also the fact that I was never much of a fan of the two angels in this, of uh, Balthamos and Baruch. I kind of enjoyed them more, actually, this time round uh, than I had on my first few reads. And this is probably my sixth or seventh reread of these books, you know. But I've just never been too much of a fan of them. And I've also not been too much of a fan of... They have these, like, dream sequences where Lyra and Roger are talking to each other through her dreams. Um, 
And I don't know, it just feels a little bit forced and unnecessary, you know. Except at the same time, it is needed to set up this whole idea of them putting an end to death and going to the world of the dead. Except I didn't really like that part of the story, so <laughs> it's kind of not needed as well. We had another reference to a scree, and this was uh, with Mary. And uh, actually, that's quite interesting. The chapter's called Mary Alone, and she's called Mary Malone, so it's a nice little play on words. But yeah, Mary finds a scree uh, in, in the world that she's in. And that one is the world of the Mulefa, and they're these like animals who kind of develop the ability to basically have wheels. And um, yeah, there's some really cool stuff on evolution and why this happened. So basically, the Mulefa, they're perfectly evolved to put these seed pods around their feet as wheels. Uh, and the seal pod, the, and then the wheels are, are uh, worn down on the ground until they eventually split in the equivalent of like a flat tire, I guess. And that's when their seeds come out, and that leads to their propagation. And th this is all made possible by like the volcanic activity around that's created these like long flat roads for them to travel along as well, you know. So I just thought it was pretty well thought out how all of these different things had all happened, and that's what had caused this evolution. The knife breaks as well. I'd forgotten that the subtle knife of the uh, the title object, I guess, of the second book, it breaks, and uh, they have to put it together again. And he gets uh, Will gets Yorick's help to do it, but Yorick's a bit reluctant, and he doesn't really want to do it, but he kind of knows he has to as well, you know. Um, which I I think also reflects Will and Will's attitude towards death because he doesn't want to kill people, but he has to. Um, he's already killed like two or three people by this point and it makes him physically sick to do it But at the same time, it's a matter of self-preservation. So he still does it, you know I've always kind of been fascinated by the scene in which they reforge the blade as well And it turns out to be kind of foreshadowing because we discover that The subtle knife has some pretty hideous side effects we also have the concept of the Republic of Heaven as well um, because we learn that God basically isn't the creator or if he is you know he there was something before god as well uh, so yeah i just think the republic of heaven is a great concept um and i like this idea of a heaven that's ruled in a slightly different way as well but with i guess some of the similar concepts that we have when we think about heaven um i also like talking of the mulefa the these strange creatures i love that they call a metaphor a make like as well i think that's a Great, great term for them. All right, so another thing that I wanted to say is how much of a badass female character Mary Malone is. I, she's actually almost as important to the story as Lyra is in her own way, uh, even though I guess she's also acting as the temptress, a bit like the equivalent of uh, the snake. I mean, the whole thing is basically a retelling of Paradise Lost, uh, which itself is a, an interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. So, uh, yeah. Just, it's interesting to reread it and to sort of notice more of those parallels, I suppose. So uh, anyway, they've headed off into the world of the dead. They have to leave their demons behind as well, which is obviously the hardest for Lyra because she's the only one who can physically see and interact with her demon. But a demon is basically the physical manifestation of our souls. So Will, who comes from our world, he doesn't necessarily have a demon. He doesn't have a you know a, an animal following him around or whatever. But he does still have to leave that part of his soul behind and he experiences it as all these voices and um, kind of things in his head, almost like things of depression and these just dark thoughts we get. So for example, he thinks about his mum and he thinks about himself saying, no, uh, don't kill me, kill her, you can have her. And for him, that's a big thing because his mum is the reason he's where he is to begin with, I suppose. And also... Um, I mean, his mum, it was his mum that he was thinking about when the subtle knife broke as well, so it's a very important motivator for his character. I also like uh, Pullman's take on the boatman, the guy who steers the boat across the river Styx, I suppose, and into the world of the dead. So I want to read this great quote out. It's, it's a long one, so bear with me. Are we dead now? Will said to the boatman. Makes no difference, he said. There's some that came here never believing they were dead. They insisted all the way that they were alive. Someone would have to pay. Made no difference. There's others who longed to be dead when they were alive, poor souls. Lives full of pain and misery. Killed themselves for a chance of a blessed rest and found that nothing had changed except for the worse. And this time there was no escape. You can't make yourself alive again. And there's been others so frail and sickly, little infants sometimes, that were scarcely born into the living before they came down to the dead. I've rowed this boat with a little crying baby on my lap many, many times that never knew the difference between up there and down here. And old folk, too, 
The rich ones are the worst, snarling and savage and cursing me, railing and screaming. What did I think I was? Hadn't they gathered and saved all the gold they could garner? Wouldn't I take some now to put them back ashore? They'd have the law on me. They had powerful friends. They knew the Pope and the King of this and the Duke of that. They were in a position to see I was punished and chastised. But they knew what the truth was in the end. The only position they were in was in my boat going to the land of the dead. And as for those kings and popes, they'd be in here too, in their turn, sooner than they wanted. I let them cry and rave. They can't hurt me. They fall silent in the end. So if you don't know whether you're dead or not, and the little girl swears blind she'll come out again to the living, I say nothing to contradict you. What you are, you'll know soon enough. Awesome writing. Alright, so what else we got? We've got this great quote, uh, I can't remember who says it now, but they say, Death is going to die. And that's kind of Lyra's mission in this book. Um, uh, I mean, plot-wise, she goes down into the world of the dead with Will. They use the subtle knife to get there. And uh, they meet up with some old friends as well. So Lyra tries to meet Roger, who um, who was in the first book and was kind of her her reason really for leaving Oxford in the first place and starting this whole three book adventure. Um, Lyra's in love with Will by this point, and Roger knows it, but she doesn't. And Pullman wrote that quite well because he didn't have to explicitly say it. It's just in the little the way that they look at each other and react to certain things, you know. They also meet Stanislaus Grumman, who is um, Will's father as well, Dr. John Parry. And um, and the second they meet him, basically, he's like, we've got no time to waste. Will, look in her hair, because uh, the church is trying to use this, this kind of bomb that uses, like, wavelengths to blow her up, basically. So, um, yeah, Will has to find an area in her scalp where some hair's been cut from and then cut that off with the knife, which you've got to be careful being close to your loved one's hair with a subtle knife because one little like if you drop it it'll just fall through their head because it's the sharpest knife in the world you know um but yeah th then will opens this doorway to another world and they throw their hair in it and then it explodes and it causes this big old abyss so then as they're leaving the world of the dead the ghosts have to walk alongside this abyss which is kind of creepy that that abyss does come into play later as well lyra also almost falls into the abyss because she's kind of showing off a bit and getting a bit cocky but then she's lucky because uh, the harpy, whose, whose name I can't remember now, but um, she befriends a harpy, basically. It's kind of an uh, enemies to friends thing in that respect. Happens quite quickly too, but it works in the context of the book. Uh, it's also Grumman who explains this core part, which is that you can't spend too much time away from your world of origin. So uh, your demon can only live its full life in the world it was born in. So we can travel as the humans, but we can only live for good in our own world. Um, and that's why Lord Asriel's enterprise, the Republic of Heaven, is doomed to fail because it's bringing people together from all of the different worlds. But it's not possibly sustainable in the long run, you know. It's a bit as though if you head into a different world, your soul kind of gets cancer. That's how I'd put it. And so Grumman says, uh, we have to build the Republic of Heaven where we are because for us, there's no elsewhere. Which I think is a great quote and something that we all as readers can take away, you know. We, wanna, we, we can all build the world we want to see. I also thought it was quite cool that Roger was the first ghost to leave the world of the dead. And there are some uh, parallels drawn here as well between Lyra leading the way for the ghosts to leave the world of the dead. And obviously in the first book in Northern Lights, she uh, frees a bunch of kids from Bolvangar where they're being tested on by the church, basically. Um, Azriel as well, Lord Azriel, he says he wants to meet Will to shake him by the hand. And he also says that the Republic of Heaven might have come into purpose solely to help Lyra and Will to find their demons after they leave the world of the dead. So to get to the world of the dead, they basically had to make this ultimate sacrifice of leaving their demons behind on the shores of the lake. Um, and yeah, when they come out from the world of the dead, they're coming basically straight out into this battlefield. And you've got uh, Metatron, who is kind of in charge of god basically he's like god's second in command i guess like like uh jesus mixed with iron man i guess except it's not very necessary they're not necessarily the good guys you can argue either side is the good side i would say uh although it's pretty clear what pullman wants you to think and i agree with him so <laughs> okay so mrs coulter she says i can't bear the thought of oblivion asriel sooner anything than that I used to think pain would be worse, to be tortured forever. I thought that must be worse, but as long as you were conscious, it would be better, wouldn't it? Better than feeling nothing, just going into the dark, everything going out forever and ever. Yeah, it's kind of what I think about when I get anxious. Uh, Lyra also gives the harpy a name, she calls her Gracious Wings, which is very kind of her. And also, 
I don't know, it kind of makes me chuckle because Lyra was given the name Lyra Silvertongue by Yorick Burnison as well, so it's good to see her now giving out names, I guess. When Will and Lyra finally uh, find their demons as well, they're actually in such a rush that they accidentally grab each other's demon, which um, is like a, the great taboo in uh, in the, their culture, you know? It just, it's wrong. It's like touching somebody else's soul. Um, and I, I like as well, it takes a while for the demons to actually forgive them for abandoning them at the shores of the Lake of the River of the Dead, you know? I think that was pretty realistic. So then they meet up with Dr. Mary Malone and they're talking about uh, the Mulefa, the creatures that live in this other world. And Will says, asks Mary, did they make the roads? And Malone says, the roads made them, if anything. So the roads are caused by like old volcanic eruptions and stuff. And it's what allows them to wear through the uh, seed pods that they use as wheels. We find out that dust has been slowly but surely, little by little, leaking out of the holes that the subtle knife makes in nature. Will at some point asks Lyra uh, if she thinks she'll ever go home again and she says she doesn't have a home, maybe Jordan College. Again, I can relate to, I feel like I don't have much of a home. And Baltimore the Angel has got a pretty good redemption arc as well, so um, yeah, he sort of becomes, is a bit of a coward really, especially after the death of Baruch. Um, but he eventually redeems himself, you know. And then Lyra tells Will that she loves him and they make out and that makes me happy even though I don't really like romance in books. This is like the only book I've ever read where I've enjoyed romance in it, you know. And uh, we learn that the witches and the shamans have to undergo the same thing that Will and Lyra did uh, in terms of being separated from their demons. But then they can roam free away from each other so that's why witches demons can travel so far. Uh, and so we kind of discover there are parts of Lyra's world, you know, where it's similar to... Um, the, the, the world of the dead where no living thing should be. So we learn all of the windows must be closed except for one and in fact the only way they can support that is by creating dust, by encouraging people to question things, question authority, etc. We also know that they can't survive in worlds other than their own world of origin so for a while you know Will thinks maybe they can have this window that they can go between from one world to the other um, but no, they need to close all the windows except for one, and so they have to leave the one out of the world of the dead open. And opening windows creates a spectre as well, so that's why they can't just open a window and really quickly go from one world to another. Um, but I think they could just go spectre hunting, because the subtle knife kills spectres, and once they're old enough, they, they'd be able to see them. So as long as every time they opened a window, they killed a spectre, you know? they'd be doing more good than harm. And then I just want to end on this last quote, which I think was wonderful. All the history of human life has been a struggle between wisdom and stupidity. Very true. In case you're wondering about the framing, it's the daytime. And I've realized if I move this this way in this angle, I can get the daylight in without just exposing you to that, that monstrosity. So uh, some more great quotes. What is worth having is worth working for. Very true. Although sometimes it feels as though it's not worth working for, especially if you're working for something and there's no guarantee that you're actually going to have it at the end, vis-a-vis, uh, uh, -vis, you know, um, you know, becoming a writer or something like that. Uh, so yeah, we, we learn that the angels are going to close all of the windows, but there are some that are created naturally where dust isn't leaking out. Um, but they're going to close those windows as well because otherwise Will and Lyra would spend their life searching for them and they have more important things to do. And I'm there just like, they, they could just tell them where these windows are, you know? Then they wouldn't have to search for them and waste their life and they could get on with... In fact, they'd probably have more of an impact because they could both impact each other's worlds. You know, they were talking about how they could take technology from one world to the other and, you know, cross-pollinate. So then the demons take on their fixed form, so Pantalaimon becomes a Pine Martin. Uh, Will touches him, and basically Lyra touches Will's demon, and uh, it's explained neither demon's going to change now, having felt a lover's hands on them. And it's sort of explained, I guess, or definitely hinted at, at the very least, that that's what happens with every demon when um, they settle into their fixed shape. And then Lyra takes, goes into Will's Oxford and they find this bench that exists in her Oxford as well as in Will's Oxford. And they promise to go there once a year at the same time. I think it was at noon on Midsummer's Day. And they'll sit on each side of it in their own respective worlds. So at least they know that they're kind of close to each other. Oh man, that kind of makes me tear, tear up a bit. And I've always wondered if that bench actually exists in Oxford. Uh, and then we get this line, uh, Will kissed her again and again, and each kiss was closer to the last one of all. It's just tragic, man. It's heartbreaking. And then they kind of close up the windows, and they've said goodbye to each other, and uh, we get this, 
Being cheerful starts now, Will thought as hard as he could. But it was like trying to hide a fighting wolf still in his arms when it wanted to claw at his face and tear at his throat. And then Will has to break the knife as well so that he doesn't have that temptation to go back through because I guess the knife could be reforged again. But it wasn't the same after it was reforged the first time and they needed Yorick Burnison, the King of the Armoured Bears, to help. So I don't think he's going to manage to reforge it in our world, you know. And then in a very British ending, uh, Will, and, Will and Mary go off to put the kettle on because they haven't, neither of them have had a good cup of tea for months. And then we go back to see what happens with Lyra. So she goes back to Jordan College. Uh, the master of Jordan College pretends that Lord Azriel paid for a bursary for her, even though he didn't. He just plans to pay for Lyra's education through his own funds and the funds of the college. And um, yeah, she decides she's going to try and study the alethiometer because when she was a girl, she had the ability to just read it kind of naturally. And when she's become essentially an adult, she can no longer do that. But she could relearn to do it through a lifetime of patient study, you know. Um, but they say, imagine having to carry a pile of books everywhere. Yes, imagine. I mean, I do that anyway in case I get some waiting time somewhere, you know. And then uh, this final little quote here. Um, I'm not sure if this is a direct quote, but this is what I took from it. The kingdom of heaven is over. There isn't any elsewhere. We shouldn't live as if it mattered more than this life and this world, because where we are is always the most important place. So, And I think that's, again, a powerful thing, you know. We should never concentrate so much on our religious beliefs that we forget about the world we live in today because that's the only certainty we have. Maybe you're right, maybe there is a heaven, who knows? But we don't, and so we have to act as though there isn't, and this life is all we have. So yeah, that's what I made of my reread of The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. This was actually for Rereadathon 2019, so I'm running a little bit late. I've got a few more rereads coming as well, and I'm taking part in Rereadathon 2020. This was created by Alex Black. Uh, sorry, it's created by Catalyst Reads and is now hosted by Alex Black. So you know, check their stuff out. And yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I gave it a four out of. 4.25 out of 5, I guess. I do think it's probably the, the weakest of the trilogy for me, but still, I'm glad I got there. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.